I just wanted to say a couple words about what we do here at Georgetown in this field before I welcome my panel and introduce everybody. I'm Andy Schoenholtz. I direct um, in the fall the asylum clinic here with Phil Schrag, who directs it in the spring, where our students represent asylum seekers in deportation hearings um, and um, actually handle a case from beginning to end for asylum seekers all over the world. My colleague Faiza Syed is here as well, who I work with, and Dina Sharouk. Is Dina here? Dina may be at some point. Um, so we have three lawyers each semester and 12 students, and um, the clinic has been doing this for, I guess, 24 years. I think Phil started the asylum part of this in 1995. Um, we also have courses on immigration and refugee law, um, as well as uh, we started last year to send volunteers to um, Texas, to the two major detention facilities that are housing women with children, detaining women and children, um, to help prepare the women for uh, credible fear interviews and to do other work to assist the families. Um, and we're sending two groups, again, of 14 volunteers over winter break and spring break down there, uh, thanks to a Georgetown alum who's funded that travel. Um, and we have a um, Human Rights Institute fact-finding practicum that has engaged on these issues for years. And this year is actually looking at the root causes of international migration in our hemisphere in particular, and is examining one of the major issues I think they're looking at is the safe third country issue. Which brings us to our panel. Uh, because we thought it would be a, a good opportunity to hear from these experts uh, with respect to the humanitarian and migration crisis that has been going on in Central America and the need for regional approaches. Uh, we have three experts uh, who will give us different uh, uh, analyses to help address p different parts of this uh, problem, and that is, um, I've asked uh, Anthony Fontes, who's a professor at American University and an expert on human insecurity in Central America, to talk to us about those challenging issues. What is the human un insecurity situation? What are the challenges in trying to address it? Um, there have been at some attempts, not major attempts, but he's the expert. I'm going to let him talk about those things. I think our community would really benefit from understanding more about how to address what's going on in the region, in these countries in particular. Um, then I, fortunately, we also have Maureen Meyer, who's the Director for Mexico and Migrant Rights at the Washington Office for Latin America. And um, she has been laboring for many years in, um, in, with focusing on the this protection sister, system in Mexico to the extent it exists. And she will talk to us about precisely what that's like. You heard this morning that because of the new transit, the, the third policy that the uh, Trump administration has put out um, more recently to try to deter asylum seekers from coming to the United States. Um, the policy is that people in transit are now have to apply for asylum on their way. At least that's what the goal of that is. So we'll hear about how, what that really means in, in, in a, a country which has, a, um, has had, well, we'll hear from the expert about that. I won't say more. And um, finally, fortunately, we have Chiara Cordelletti Carroll, who's the Deputy Regional Representative for the U.S. and the Caribbean um, at the U.N. and High Commissioner for Refugees Office. And uh, she will be talking about the regional approach, the approaches, I should say, that would really benefit the um, abilities of our entire international community to protect refugees who are fleeing from very serious harm, um, both in terms of the Refugee Convention and the Cartagena Declaration, uh, right, which extends protection to refugees who are fleeing from very serious violence, civil war, et cetera. Um, this is a regional uh, crisis. There are Central American countries that um, ha have received many refugees as well and who are trying to 
or could use some help in addressing those needs. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. We will have some time for, of course, Q&A. So let us begin um, with Professor Fontes, who will talk to us about the human insecurity situation in uh, the countries that he's particularly focused on in Central America. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks so much for putting on um, uh, this amazing venue. I think it's one of the most important conversations that could be happening in America right now. Um, so I'll start with a little story. Uh, in July 2016, uh, I spoke with a 20-year-old Guatemalan man named Wilmer who was traveling through Mexico and looking to cross in the United States. We were in Veracruz. Uh, for people like me, he said, my country is like a cage with no way out. We were waiting with dozens of other Central Americans um, to hop a, a northbound freight train. And we all know that this journey is dangerous, he continued. We might fail, we might even die, but at least there's some hope at the end of it. So in the little time that I have here, I'm going to try to give an overview of the forces that have made people like Wilmer uh, feel so trapped and hopeless in their native lands and what might be done to uh, resolve some of these issues. Uh, although in, in my initial talk, I'll probably just talk about the challenges and then get to some of those solutions in the, uh, uh, in the Q&A. All right. So I'm going to focus on the making of, of the Central American cage, to push the metaphor, uh, to understand the complex play between poverty, violence, and the drive out migration from the region. Uh, so I'm an ethnographer by, train, um, by training, focusing on everyday lived experience of extreme peacetime insecurity and precarity. And in this talk, I'm going to try to link my field work um, with the macro processes that help explain general trends in immigration over the last uh, couple decades. So three connected issues, the evolution of violence and insecurity, the persistence of poverty in the region, and how both poverty and insecurity entwine in myriad ways uh, in pushing individual cases about migration and trends in general. So the first thing to understand about the region is that the Northern Triangle has long been uh, a place where globally circulating violence and insecurity seem to become distilled and erupt in ter with terrifying intensity. Um, so what is now known as the, uh, the old violence uh, among people who study Northern the Northern Triangle. Um, at the height of the Cold War, uh, overarmed military governments in Guatemala and El Salvador, tra trained, funded, and given political cover by the United States, engaged in massive atrocities against mostly civilian populations who were suspected of supporting insurgencies against the elite-ruled governments. Now, these insurgencies themselves came into being because regional elites refused to allow poor citizenry, citizenry to engage in the most basic political activities, from uh, elections, forming unions, or even learning to read. Rather than heed the calls of the social movements calling for fair division of economic and political opportunities coming from a diverse range of voices, uh, the overarmed militaries in the 1970s and 80s resorted to massive disappearance and scorched earth campaigns that claimed hundreds of thousands of civilian lives. And the bloodiest theater was Guatemala, where I've done most of my work. And this also drove the first massive waves of refugees out of the region seeking um, refuge in Mexico and the United States. And those of us who have been engaged in this for a long time might, I think, can think of parallels and echoes from that time um, with, the, with the situation that Central Americans face now. Although now, the kinds of violence that are taking place are very, very different. Um, since uh, the end of the Cold War, the rise of what scholars call the new violence has, has really uh, hit hard in the Northern Triangle of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Uh, it's across Latin America, democracy has been, uh, the rise of democracy has been accompanied by uh, the rise of um, uh, criminal chaos, in, in the words of, um, as described by many uh, observers in the region. And this new violence is very difficult to pick apart. Uh, the legacies of the armed conflicts are very important. They still haunt the post-Cold War order. Um, and the end of armed conflict did not bring peace um, as we would imagine it. So through the 1990s, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras each saw a sudden sharp rise in criminal violence, initially concentrated in large urban centers, Guatemala City, San Pedro Sula, San Salvador, etc. Um, and this new violence, in many ways, is far harder to diagnose than was the old. Um, government officials and outside observers tend to gauge it through homicide counts, right? And through most of the 21st century, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador have registered some of the highest number of murders proportional to the population um, in, the, in the world, coming in the top five consistently until the last few years um, uh, where things have gotten moderately better, at least in, in the counting of dead bodies. But um, in a sense, so here's a 2018 homicide um, map in, of Guatemala. 
can see the concentration of uh, the highest murder rates in border regions, and I'm going to talk about it in a second. That has much to do with, uh, um, it's thought to have much to do with the drug trade uh, and the competition between different organizations for control of lucrative border crossings. El Salvador uh, was primarily affected by um, gang-related violence, uh, although, again, under the gangs themselves are, um, are not as clear-cut as the media and, and, um, and many outside observers and law enforcement would have them be. Um, violence is more equally spread through the country. And then Honduras is in many ways sort of, sort of in between Guatemala and El Salvador in terms of who's driving the violence, major issues of gang violence in uh, urban centers, uh, as well as along major uh, drug trafficking corridors in the northern and western parts of the country. Um, so, you know, homicide counts all well and good as a way of gauging what's happening um, in terms of violence, but in a sense, these body counts obscure more than they reveal. Uh, as hard and fast as the numbers may seem, what makes this violence so terrifying um, to so many is its profound uncertainty. Across the region, less than 5% of violent crimes ever make it to trial, uh, making the Northern Triangle a great place to commit murder, uh, to paraphrase a uh, UN Special Rapporteur's ob observation. Forces of order and disorder often make distorted reflections of each other. So at best, the law appears helpless and at worst complicit, making the list of usual suspects in every murder, extortion, kidnapping, robbery, long and badly defined. And police regularly exchange places with the narco-traffickers, kidnapping rings, gangs, and so on that they're supposed to be bringing to justice. What's more, massacre, torture, dismemberment, and other spectacular forms of violence um, that are literally made for, the media, for media consumption um, uh, make the murder register far and wide beyond uh, its particular locale. So the cacophony of public reaction, sensationalist media reporting, politicians grandstanding, the rumors coursing through violence-stricken communities warps the fear of this violence and insecurity into every realm of public life. So this uncertainty, this general sense that no one is to be trusted, um, I think explains why, for example, even as homicide rates, homicide rates across the region have apparently dropped, especially if you check out this uh, image up here in Honduras, which is um, essentially cut in half uh, the number of people murdered per 100,000 per year uh, between 2013 and 2018. The fact is, general le levels of fear, paranoia, and per per pervasive insecurity remain very, very high, um, in, in fact, almost untouched. The general population has no trust that their governments can effectively combat crime, much less count the dead, and understand that the state and its underworld coexist in deep symbiotic relationships with one another. So especially in Honduras and Guatemala, there's a strong sense that state agents are key players in the reproduction of crime and impunity, as they are, um, with estimates of the proportion of police in the pay of organized crime ranging between 30 and 60 percent of the total. This makes for a particularly volatile and powerful violent actor ecosystem. Um, the, those at the top um, uh, are, are widely considered to be drug trafficking organizations, right? And this is a map of, um, from 2016, I, I couldn't find a, a, a one from more recently that was as telling, but things haven't changed much. Uh, the, the, uh, an estimation of the number of um, non-commercial um, uh, uh, boating incidents connecting the Southern Cone to uh, the Northern Triangle, and it's, a, it's a, a way of measuring the amount of cocaine that's going through the region. So um, the impunity that criminal actors, especially drug trafficking organizations, enjoy is truly awe-inspiring. Um, and the, the drug traffickers are probably at the, at the height, at the very uh, top end of the violent actor food chain in this part of the world. Over the last 30 years, the U.S. war on drugs has pushed the flow of cocaine and a host of other illicit commodities through Honduras and Guatemala, away from the Caribbean, uh, and even at, since 2006, out of, uh, out of Mexico, um, and into uh, primarily Honduras and Guatemala. And today, it's, it's believed that upwards of 90% of the cocaine consumed by the so-called insatiable North American nose comes through Honduras and Guatemalan territory. <clears throat> and the profits and power of drug trafficking circulate at every level of state power. So uh, this is an image drawn from a uh, work of my, my friend Stephen Dudley at Insight Crime um, at the Center for Latin American Studies at American University. And it, it details the, con the le connections between a man named Juan Chamale, who um, was an, uh, one of the lead narco-traffickers up until his capture uh, uh, about five or six years ago uh, in the western part of Guatemala. 
um, and it details the, the level of uh, his interaction and involvement, infiltration of um, the various levels of government, uh, civil society, evangelical churches, as well as um, local politics and local businesses as well. Here's another example. Um, this is the Cachiros, one of the uh, major drug trafficking organizations based in Honduras, also has been um, uh, captured and leaders extradited, although the kingpin strategy doesn't work. Um, we can talk more about that if we want to, but cut the, it, it only leads to sort of more uh, violence and competition between the surviving groups that are still there. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry, so taking out the leaders only um, makes the, the uh, underlings more ambitious. Uh, but this also details the sort of circulation of power and influence between uh, drug trafficking organizations and the, uh, the powers that be in those particular countries. A particularly um, salient example of this is Juan Orlando Hernandez, the present uh, president of Honduras. Um, he's a U.S. partner in the signing of, uh, of a pretty ridiculous third country agreement, which um, a colleague here will talk about. Uh, also, his brother is facing a trial in New York for involvement in narco trafficking, and there's much uh, talk that um, that his that Juan Orlando's, uh, or as he's known in, in Honduras, Ho, uh, has received uh, at, le at least a million dollars in funding from uh, narco traffickers associated with his brother, allegedly. All right. Um, the other uh, sort of most other uh, one of the most visible violent actors in uh, in Central America, are of course, gangs. And this is probably an image that. Um, Many of you have seen, this is, you know, since the early, early 90s, transnational gangs like the Mara Salvatrucha, MS-13, Barrio 18 or 18th Street have sort of been the very face of crime in the region. Um, and for those of you who don't know, they're born out of circular migration between the U.S. and Central America in the 1970s through the 90s. And the MS-13 and Barrio 18 have morphed into extortion machines in, the Central, in Central America, and especially in Honduras. The MS-13 has evolved to become an important player in ur urban drug market distribution, and some people even say taking the place of um, uh, the drug trafficking organizations and the, uh, th that were taken out by uh, USDEA efforts and have sort of subsumed a higher level of involvement uh, in, uh, in transnational uh, traffic of cocaine. So gangs like MS-13 and uh, and the Barrio de Siocho are primarily an urban phenomenon. Uh, but I, part of my work, and I've, my, my, much of my work has been involved in tracing the evolution of gangs, but really understanding the evolution of gangs is a way to understand the evolution of violence in society, has been to try to get beneath that, that phantasmagorical, spectacular image of the tattooed gang member um, residing behind bars, which by and large uh, is, is a much smaller part of the gang population today than it has been um, because of um, increased enforcement against people who have face tattoos, and so on and so forth. And these days, an important thing to understand for asylum cases as well is that gangs are absolutely embedded in the communities over which they rule. It's, you can't pull apart the police, the local community, and the operation of the gangs, um, uh, which is one of the reasons that makes it such a terrifying phenomenon, because literally it's neighbors um, fighting and killing against other, uh, one, uh, their, their, their neighbors. So this is uh, affiliates of the gang extortion network. Um, there are some 36 people indicted in this. And these are the mothers, daughters, uh, uh, sisters and wives of uh, incarcerated gang members involved in extortion network. Another uh, gang member, member of MS-13 in a Guatemalan prison. Another young man, 19 at the time. Striking to me about this picture is, is you know, he has this typical, prototypical gang tattooed face, but he also has an image of himself he painted with his four-year-old daughter in his visiting quarters in prison. Um, so. These gangs have become the very face of crime, as I said, uh, and they're important criminal, criminal actors ordering life in the areas they control, but they're also a smokescreen, and that's important to remember, uh, a specter invoked over and over again by political actors to distract the populace, to distract um, uh, uh, outside observers from a host of structural factors that feed out of control and security. Now, there's a tendency also to call the violence that's happening today non-state violence. And I think that's a, a dangerous misnomer, uh, um, because, or even non-political violence. It's a mistake to imagine the state, Guatemalan, Honduran, and Salvadoran state, as having no part in perpetuating the violence that's taking place today. Whether it's through institutional weakness or outright complicity, agents of the state play key roles in feeding and feeding off the violent impunity that drives out migration. There's literally almost no way to draw the state apart from the criminal underworld upon which it rests. All right. Um, so now poverty. <clears throat> P 
Poverty in, in this region remains as pressing, if not quite as widespread, as it was in the 1970s and 80s when, as I said before, massive social movements for workers and subsistence farmers um, helped drive armed insurrection. Now, part of this issue is that there are no formal market jobs. Uh, in 2018, more than 300,000 Central Americans joined a labor pool, while there are less than 4,000 jobs created by the formal economy. Uh, and these are concentrated almost entirely in urban areas. So that relegates the vast, vast majority of Central Americans, especially rural Central Americans, to scraping by in the informal market. The economies themselves uh, depend upon uh, export of a few commodities to primary, pr primarily U.S. markets, and they employ a tiny fraction of the workforce. We're talking maquilas, we're talking sugarcane, um, uh, some manufactured goods, uh, and uh, one rising uh, um, export industry is actually call centers for U.S. businesses, right, uh, um, employing deportees because of their unaccented English. Uh, always an opportunity, right? <laughs> right. So. This, this, this general reliance on a few commodities uh, meant for export to primarily U.S. markets has created society split between an extremely small and extremely rich um, elite group at the top and masses of poor at the bottom with only a tiny sliver of a, of a fairly desperate middle class clinging to the middle. Overall, inequality in the region is stunning and it appears to be worsening. Um, so one important pressure valve uh, has always been, for the last 30 years or so, and growing in importance, remittances from the U.S. Uh, a recent study by uh, Manuel Orozco at International uh, Inter-American Di um, Inter Dialogue found that remittances make up 50% of household incomes for one in three families in the region. Um, one can only imagine what will happen when that lifeline um, starts uh, slimming down if, uh, if the present administration's um, uh, actions against immigrants continue. So, you know, I, this, this issue of this dichotomy between asylum seekers and economic migrants is something that plays a lot into a discourse around um, against uh, uh, immigration and people are just coming to take jobs and so on and so forth. And yeah, the, the, I, there's, there's, there's true that many people are going because of economic, for economic reasons, but as another man I met from Honduras who was traveling through Tabasco State in Mexico said, it was either immigrate or listen to my children crying because they're hungry. What would you do? Um, and to which I'd... Don't, I, I don't have a viable answer. So how do they entwine? A recent survey found that one in four Northern Triangle citizens would like to immigrate, a lot more than actually do, and those that do aren't, aren't usually the poorest of the poor. Those people can't afford the journey. And the reasons they do immigrate are diverse, dependent on particular contexts. So while pressing poverty, especially in rural zones of Guatemala, is an important driver of out-migration, Violence and poverty entwine in a variety of ways um, that is distinct in, in each uh, migrant's story. So one phenomenon I think is, bears looking at is the ways that internal displacement, because of violence, uh, often precedes the decision to actually leave the country, a decision that no one takes, li um, takes lightly. Um, so one of the reasons is that, you know, for example, here we go. So this is a recent study from Honduras. Um, the the off people who lose their place in their particular neighborhood because of whether it's gang action or um, uh, uh, a, in some cases it's because people being made landless because of multinational corporation projects, whatever it is, once because socioeconomic well-being is so intensely tied to familial networks and to um, the uh, the ability of to be able to uh, be taken care of by um, extensive family uh, and social networks in the place where you are from. It, it, for poor Central Americans, you can't just leave where you live and go live somewhere else in the country. That's not viable. There's no way to actually take care of your family. So in my work, I've heard many stories of people who um, were internally displaced by extortion by a gang, left their neighborhood, um, tried to live in a rural area with an aunt or a cousin or extended family of some kind. Eventually, uh, they wore out their welcome, and they, couldn't, they could no longer sustain themselves or their family, and they had to leave the country. Now, that particular story, where does that fit into asylum law protocols even before the Trump administration, right? It's a very difficult thing to sell because, in many ways, asylum law is a tiny door that holds up the big wall. Uh, but it's that combination of poverty and sustained um, uh, collective widespread poverty um, that makes poverty the condition and, ex and experience with violence the spark that drives out migration. So I'll just end by saying that the caging of Central America, this cage, is only being reinforced um, by present policies. 
Uh, we're now, in a sense, reinforcing the bars of that cage by every metric imaginable, broadening, expanding, intensifying the forces that have driven migration in the first place. So the conditions of violation at work here are decades in the making and will only be resolved through sustained long-term engagement that involves the United States, the UN, and other actors across the region. I'm happy to talk about those things um, in the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Professor Fontes. And we will, I'm sure there will be good, some good questions about that follow-up. Um, before I ask Maureen to um, start talking, I forgot to do a housekeeping uh, matter, which is that there, if for those who happen to have brought in drinks, even though that apparently is, that's not um, allowed, if you have, <coughs> would you please take them from the edges of the, thank you so much. I'm here to protect those who are below you right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Maureen, um, please. Thank you. And the is yours. Thanks to, to Georgetown Law MPI and Clinic for, for the invitation to, to speak at, at this you know, annual um, conference, which we always find very interesting. So Anthony looked a lot at why people are, are leaving Central America, and I was asked to look at what happens to those that are on their journey or that end up staying in Mexico. Mexico is that sandwich country a lot of times between Central America and then for a lot of people what they originally viewed as their main destination, which is the United States. And sort of looking at what, a, what is Mexico's protection capacity right now and then what are the limitations that they're facing, particularly as it relates to Central American asylum seekers. And, and wanted to say, obviously, what we've seen in the past few months has been a dramatic increase in apprehensions in Mexico, again, and a real shift from when we saw López Obrador, the, the Mexican president who was elected last December, um, you know, policies of being a welcoming country, looking at alternatives for people to stay and work in Mexico, too, mostly response to, you know, U.S. threats and, and, and pressure dramatically cracking down on immigration and migrants in transit through the country. Um, they have apprehended as of August of this year over 144,000 migrants in transit, 85% from Central America. And, and if you look at how this is, how much bigger it is than last year, if you compare those same eight months, it's a 67% increase you know, from one year to the next. So they've dramatically again, I would say, because it's not the first time Mexico's uh, increased apprehension in response to, to US pressure, um, but they've again really dramatically increased apprehensions. But at the same time, and what's sort of different, I think, than what we saw when they had you know, originally increased or their apprehensions in 2014-15 with Mexico's southern border program is the dramatic increase in asylum requests. So last week, the, the Mexican um, Refugee Agency, the Commission to Support Refugees, released um, the most recent numbers, which is from, from January to December the, the, to September Sorry, of this year, Mexico had received 54,377 <laughs> asylum requests. And this is a little bit over three times more than they received all of last year. And if you look back, just like how big of an increase this is, um, in 2015, so just four years ago, Mexico received only 3,424 asylum requests. So we have over 54,000 now compared to just a couple thousand a few years ago. So it's a huge increase for a country that really didn't feel the, the pressure to, to, to stand up an effective asylum, I think, system until very recently. So why? Then why is it that there have so many more people seeing Mexico um, as a possibility or a destination? And I think there's many reasons, not just um, in response to the United States. One is there has been increased outreach in Central America and Mexico, and I think Kara can talk more about the UNHCR's efforts, but it's really hard to go to southern Mexico right now and not see at migrant shelters or elsewhere posters about, here, this is your right to seek protection. There are migrant shelters throughout Mexico that actively screen migrants and educate you know, asylum seekers of, here's your rights, here's what, you know, you might be able to request protection in Mexico, here's how, and there's also a much broader network of organizations and lawyers, I mean, also, again, supported by uh, UNHCR that can provide that legal guidance and assistance that you didn't have a few years ago. So one is that kind of knowledge people have of Mexico as a destination country is coupled with us improved reception capacity. So I said there are more shelters and organizations and others that are able to support asylum seekers. I think another factor is word of mouth and you know, successful settlement. So I was in Tapachula in, in Chiapas in, in August, and we were outside the detention center, Siglo XXI, talking to asylum seekers. They have to go every week there and have their paper signed that they're continuing with their asylum claim. And speaking to several, especially from Honduras, 
they were, if they had their asylum claim re resolved favorably, they were going to stay in Mexico. They're like, oh yeah, we have friends up in Monterrey or Mexicali, and I heard I can get a job. So you're starting to see more people that know people that have successfully settled in Mexico, and so I think they believe it's an option for them. And, and then lastly, obviously, is the, the increasing obstacles people are facing to receive protection in the United States. And I think that is also word of mouth, but also a reality. And I think if you look at even what's happening in northern Mexico with thousands and thousands of people being forced to wait for an appointment with the United States and very precarious conditions to those that are being sent back to Mexico through the so-called migrant protection protocols or remain in Mexico program, more and more, we don't have numbers on it right now, but from organizations on the northern border that will say, more people are deciding to opt to request asylum in Mexico because it's just so, it's become so difficult to stay or to, to wait for an appointment in the United States and it's so dangerous in, in those border towns, so wanting to see where else they could move and then see Mexico as a destination. So what are the obstacles that they may face if they decide to do that? And some are legal and then some are just in practice and others are, are resource-based. I mean, I think one, just looking at Mexico's legal system, currently it's not easy to request asylum in Mexico. You have a 30-day limit from the time you enter the country to when you have to apply for asylum. It's actually being challenged in Mexico Supreme Court. Uh, they should be resolving it in the, I'm not, hopefully this, uh, this semester. So there's that obstacle. The other is you need to stay in the state where you request it asylum because you have to appear either every eight days or 15 days to have your asylum paper signed, meaning that you're continuing with your claim. Most of these people are requesting asylum in southern Mexico and particularly in Chiapas. Chiapas, the Tapachula sector, has 66% of all of Mexico's asylum claims. So you're in an area where even though you technically should be able to get a humanitarian visa that allows you to, to work while you're there, that's also really backlog. And so you have accumulation of people in Mexico's poorest state where they don't have, I mean, it's 70 some percent of the population in Chiapas lives in poverty. So you don't have a, an area where there's a really an adequate system to support people that are waiting for their claims to be processed. And I know UNHCR has been doing a lot to support that population, but I think it is an obstacle that you are, you are in places that are not necessarily adequate to support you while you're waiting and face challenges of adequate housing, healthcare, education, et cetera. Um, and then the other are just even practices by Mexican officials or what their, um, their interpretation of their responsibilities. So even if you approach a port of entry in southern Mexico, you will be facing time in detention before you're allowed to continue with your asylum claim. So it's not as if you are going to be, you know, you're, the only way you're actually you're allowed to pursue asylum without being apprehended is if you're lucky enough to reach a coma office or a shelter before you get apprehended meaning that very few people, given increased enforcement, are not facing at least weeks in pretty awful detention con center conditions that have you know, continuously been documented as having lack of access to medical care, appropriate food, overcrowding, and I think even more so now with, as a result of Mexico's increased enforcement. So you have a very limited alternative to detention program that I think have had about 8,000 people that have been released from detention based on a program that Comar and the Mexican Immigration Agency has with the UNHCR and shelters to release people. But a lot of times you're actually going to be in detention for the entire time your claim is taking place, which is technically 45 days, but can be months right now. So you're faced with a lot of obstacles. I think the last on that is lack of proper screening. Um, there. There's a citizen commission of Mexico's immigration agency that had did a monitoring mission of a lot of Mexico's detention centers throughout the country in 2016. And they found you know, overall that Mexican government priorities are to detect, detain, and deport people and not really looking at protection. And the majority of the people that were interviewed in this mission reported never having received information about their right to apply for protection in Mexico or they didn't understand what they were receiving. And I think that's the other, it's just like lack of clarity and sort of obstacles placed on them by Mexican officials of you don't want to request asylum. And if you do, it's going to be a long time. You're going to be in detention. You can't access a lawyer. It's really difficult to get access to legal assistance when you are in detention. You almost have to know who to ask for from an organization so they can come see you. So a huge sort of obstacles, even if you want to request asylum, to be able to do so in Mexico. And this means that about 10% of asylum claims in Mexico don't pursue it and another 20 to 25% of those abandon their claims, either because they're tired of being in detention or they can't stay out on the streets and support their family anymore or they feel they just don't have any option to stay in Mexico. That said, I think Mexico has started to make progress on its 
asylum system, and you know, they, certainly the UNHCR has a lot to do with that. With the Lopes Salvador administration, they named a, a head of the, the refugee agency, Comar Andres Ramirez, who comes from the UNHCR, has a lot of history, knows what needs to be done to strengthen their system. Um, looking at how do you increase training for your staff, how do you increase resources. We are seeing more cases being resolved favorably. Um, I think they had mentioned that Mexico obliges by the, the Cartagena Declaration, its immigration and refugee law has that definition of someone being threatened by generalized viol violence or massive violations of human rights as possible conditions to receive asylum. They are starting to apply that definition more and more. It's been pretty much blanket ap application for Venezuelans seeking asylum in Mexico, but almost 100% of Venezuelans get asylum in Mexico. But they're doing it more and more for individuals from Honduras and El Salvador. And you can see it in the numbers. In 2017, only about half of the asylum seekers from Honduras were getting um, refugee status or protection, like a, a complementary protection. This past year, at least this part of this year, it's increased 81%. So you're seeing more and more people actually successfully getting protection in Mexico. And I think in all of this, um, UNHCR support has been critical, both in increasing the Comar capacity to increasing civil society capacity. Um, I will let you talk more about that, but I think what we have not seen is a real commitment so far, even with the new government of Mexico, to designate Mexican resources to at strengthening and building up an effective asylum system. So a few years ago, it was sort of a joke that Mexico had 15 asylum officers for the same, the whole country. It's like, really, that's like, how can they do that? Even now, today, they have about 48 Me like full-time Mexican paid staff. The budget that Comar got this year with a new government that's promising you know, significant shifts and prioritizing humanitarian assistance, et cetera, had a budget of $1.2 million for the entire country for an asylum agency that is right now facing 54,000 requests. And you would think that that would mean that next year they would have an even bigger budget. Well, the budget proposal that came out in September only increases Comar's budget by $300,000. So, you know, I think we see, I mean, the UNHCR Commissioner Grandi was in Mexico about two weeks ago. They had great meetings with the Mexican Minister of the Interior, with the Immigration Agency, with, with the Foreign Ministry, and they're all talk as government officials of having a tradition of receiving refugees, of being a country that's hospitable, that wants to promote humanitarian treatment. It's not yet reflected in their budget priorities. I think that's Mexico's biggest challenge is you cannot continue to have an entire asylum system supported by just um, for the most part, the UNHCR and civil society organizations doing the work to, to screen and support asylum seekers. Um, Andres Ramirez, as the head of the agency, knows of these budget shortfalls. He believes they need to have six times at least the current resources to have the staff they need, to have the training they need. Um, we met with Comar staff in Tapachula. Again, this is an office that's facing like 60% of the claims. They're tired. They work 12-hour days. They're paying for their own paper. I mean, it's just, it's a real... It's a real crisis, I think, and the system has been repeatedly alerted as being under verge of the collapse, even by Mexico's Human Rights Com um, Commission last year. Like, you need to designate more resources to it. Um, I think that's like Mexico's biggest challenge in terms of the system itself is government commitment to making it work. We believe, you know, UNHCR has done an amazing job to sort of expand capacity, but you also need the government to start designating more resources. And then just last, the, a few things to consider about Mexico as an asylum country. Um, one is Mexico is not safe for all asylum seekers, particularly from the Northern Triangle. I think there's been many cases or concerns of, given geographical proximity, persecutors that are pursuing people, particularly in Southern Mexico, especially when they're waiting for their asylum claims to be um, processed. You know when they're waiting outside the Comar Agency. There's every day there's people visibly waiting to have their papers signed. So it's easy for someone, if they want to go after you, to cross the border and do it. I think we've seen that, especially with women victims of domestic violence, especially linked to, to criminal organizations in, in Central America. The LBGTI community has been persecuted in Mexico as well, and I think it's also a particularly vulnerable population. Um, and you know, Mexico isn't safe for a lot of asylum seekers or migrants in transit. We've documented for, for many years multiple high horrific crimes against migrants in transit and where the criminal justice system has basically had 100% impunity for crimes against migrants. Our work had found about less than 1% of crimes that were reported were actually investigated for, for crimes against migrants. Um, there's a surge in Mexicans that are requesting asylum in the United States, so a lot of Mexicans don't feel it's a safe country for them. And so I think that is one of their big challenges, just the security crisis in parts of Mexico and populations that really probably wouldn't be 
adequately protected given you know, their own characteristics or geographic proximity to their, their country of origin. Um, the others are more integration challenges. A lot of organizations that support refugees and asylum seekers in Mexico talk about the fact that people that get refugee status in Mexico still struggle with having adequate housing, healthcare, education, having their work, their, their documents recognized by Mexican employers as being valid. Um, and I think even where you have cities that have been you know, targeted and where UNHCR has worked to sort of move people out of southern Mexico, so Saltillo in northern Mexico, Guadalajara, Monterrey, even then, you know, you have a lot of jobs that are in the maquila sector, so the, the, the factories, they don't pay that well either. And so someone's still that economic struggle. I was talking to the head of the shelter in Saltillo on Friday, and he was saying that some refugees actually still come to the shelter on Sundays to get a good meal. So I think there's still that sort of challenge. And there is a um, challenge of Mexican population that has a less than 1% foreign born as a country to really effectively view refugees and asylum seekers as constructive important parts of their society. In fact, I think what we've seen this year is a very unfortunate growing sense of xenophobia in, in Mexico from protests in Tapachula to not having wanting the, the Comar office to be downtown to protests when the Comar office is being moved somewhere else to like not wanting it there to even I, my Uber driver in Mexico City on Saturday morning that was feeling very resentful of the fact that the Lopez Obrador administration was going to offer jobs to Central Americans in Mexico instead of working to create more jobs for Mexicans. And so I think there's the other broader you know, area of how do you really, what's Mexico's reception capacity? And that also needs to include how do you work with Mexican society so that they become much more welcoming and, and willing to have that broader um, refugee population living in their communities. So I think I would leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. Chiara, if you would round this out for us by talking to us about the you know, regional approaches and UNHCR's engagement. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having us here talking about this very important subject. Um, I, my understanding is that you talked about the problem at source, and Maureen talked a bit about what, uh, what is being done. And my job is sort of setting it all in, in context and, and talking a bit about what can be done at, on a regional level to, to sort of try and address this problem. And I wanted to start talking a bit about something that I think exemplifies best this continent, because we have a crisis in Central America, but we also have other crises going on at the moment, which are much bigger. And in a sense, uh, the continent puts forward some of the best practices we have um, and some of the worst practices, uh, practices we have on responsibility sharing, which I think it's really the underpinning of what has enabled the international protection regime to remain alive over the past six years. The fact that when there is a big problem, um, it can be just the problem of one country, but many have to come together and sort of help each other out and try to find solutions. And that has worked. It's worked all over the world for many, many years, not perfectly with many, many problems, but certainly has enabled the Middle East to, to sort of uh, stay afloat uh, despite the big uh, Syrian crisis and has helped Africa uh, do the same in, in many circumstances. And it has helped this continent. Uh, a few years ago, we didn't have a Venezuela. Uh, this, today, we have over 4.2 million Venezuelans who have left their countries in 16 countries. And uh, we, of course, hear about Venezuela, but we don't hear as much uh, troubles as we hear about Central America. And that is because, despite all the problems and despite the huge numbers, 16 countries have come together to find a way to share the responsibility in a humane manner and in a way that really reflects the, 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 the responsibility of the continent. Of course, there are challenges there too, but we can certainly say that there has been a display of, of, of hospitality in the context of Venezuela that has been, I think, in my view, remarkable. If we just think about what Colombia has done, you know, receiving over 1.2 million people, despite of the fact that they have over 7 million IDPs still in their country. So I think a remarkable display of solidarity there and something that that I think uh, is to be, to be sort of looked at when, when we are looking at how to resolve large-scale uh, uh, refugee and migrants flows. The second example that we very little talk about is Nicaragua. Today, Costa Rica has received over 120,000 asylum applications all alone and is doing it all alone. And that is another very remarkable uh, show of, of, of goodwill and willingness to sort of do the right thing. And with very little help, I must add, uh, there has been some support to Costa Rica, but nearly not enough for, for what it has taken on. 
And so these are two examples of, of sort of country rolling up their sleeves and saying, okay, we have a problem, and how do we resolve it, and how do we talk about it? There is a new Quito process of Venezuela. There is a regional platform that is responding. There, are, there is real concrete actions on the ground that I think we can look at. When it comes to the Northern Triangle, it has been, I honestly have been spoke, speaking about this subject for the past six years now. Um, the problems are the same. They haven't changed. Um, the same drama persists. We still have a problem on narrative, which is still incredible, but there are still people that are wondering whether people living from Central America are refugees, which is hard to believe when you see what actually happens to these people. There's still a problem of infrastructure in the, in the region where asylum systems are still very nascent. We still have very serious problem of capacity, which Maureen was pointing to, uh, when it comes to Mexico, which is the best off in many ways. But if we look at many other countries, we are still definitely not there. Guatemala is not there. Belize is not there. Um, you know, and, and so on. So we still have uh, a few countries sort of taking on a lot of, of, the, of, the, of the responsibility for these refugee flows. So if this is the setting a little bit of what we have, uh, what have we done? What have we tried to do? For the past, I would say, six years now, we have been stressing the need for a regional approach that this problem requires a multifaceted response of a regional, of a regional um, extent that brings everybody to, together to look at source country, transit country, and asylum countries to figure out a way of managing this problem in a more sort of coherent manner. Um, so we have launched a, a sort of what we call a... Um, a comprehensive response framework for, 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 for Central America that brings together seven countries and that has brought sort of from a political uh, perspective seven countries together to really look at what needed to be done and this was four years ago. Um, and sort of looking at what needed to be done in El Salvador, in, in, in El Salvador, Guatemala, and, and, in, and in Honduras, in terms of managing the displacement dimension there. So what were some of the programs that needed to be launched to really try and look at communities that were at high risk, and how do we try and, and help uh, youth and, and children and women who are living in those neighborhoods? How do we stabilize population there in the best possible way? And then we had discussions about how do we strengthen an asylum system across the region so that they can be better equipped to deal with, with asylum application and providing protection. And of course, we have been talking about solutions. So what kind of solutions can we make available to, 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 to people who are taking uh, very, very uh, lots of risks to come to this country in particular to find protection? And so through this approach and quite a lot of investment, uh, both at the political level but also at the operational level. UNHCR has open offices all over, all over the continent by now to really try and support governments in providing responses. Um, some of the uh, data that Maureen was pointing to, the fact that today we have a very high number of asylum applications is not is not a coincidence. There are lots of refugees, but also now refugees can make asylum applications, something that was not possible uh, four years ago. Um, I remember myself being in Tapachula five years ago, and there was, there was families living in camps, in, camps in, in, in parks under the star, literally, and had no idea where to go seek asylum. So today, that, today that's no longer the picture that we have in Mexico. I mean, we're far from being uh, you know, close to perfection, but certainly Mexico today is offering a set of facilities that wasn't happening or were, weren't offering yesterday. Same goes with Costa Rica, which has made massive steps forward, and of course with smaller countries like, uh, like Belize and Guatemala. To, for example, Guatemala is a small country, doesn't obviously has its own problem, and I think uh, uh, you have quite well explained what those problems are, but it, it is slowly but surely becoming a country of asylum. It has doubled its asylum applications over the past year, couple of years. Um, not for everybody, but for some profile of refugees, that is the case. So we are seeing uh, some, uh, some result in terms of the number of people that are, uh, that are approaching UNHCR, that are approaching governments. We're seeing a much lar larger shelter network throughout the region. Uh, over uh, 80 shelters, uh, new shelters have been developed throughout the region uh, over the past, uh, over the past uh, few years. We're seeing asylum systems that are not perfect for sure, but certainly starting to 
move and function in a way that they were not functioning just a few years ago. And we are, we are looking at more and more people being granted protection and being, and being adjudicated in, in a favorable way, which again, is I think it's, it's an important data. Now, this, this regional framework has also brought uh, into the mix a lot, of, uh, a lot of political actors. The OAS, for example, is about to launch a trans, trans fund to support countries who are developing programs for Central America. We are also seeing more and more political buy in into this into this uh, into this framework but the reality is that uh, the investment in this region have been very very limited for the problem that it that it's it's facing so as much as UNHCR and many other civil society actors are trying to do their best we still have a situation in front of us where investment has been minimal when the 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 the, 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 the notion of we have a protection problem we need to resolve it is still far from 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 being tackled in 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 the right way there are various initiatives underway some more complex than others, but the reality is that we're still not there and uh, countries are still very much struggling with, with, with what they need to do. So um, I would leave it at that in terms of sort of the overall picture and perhaps we can have a conversation and respond to questions. Excellent, thank you very much, Chiara. So I'll invite people to come forward um, to ask questions, so go to any mic um, if you'd like to, and please, when you ask questions, identify yourselves. Um, so, and if you're asking it to a particular panelist, please do that. So take your time, but in the meantime, because I'm a professor, I'll ask some questions. But please do come forward, because I'll stop as soon as I see you, honestly. And I already see somebody coming. I didn't have to go that far. <laughs> Could you reintroduce yeah. yourself? My Thank you is, so much. My name is John Ashley. I'm sorry I asked a question at panel one, but I'm oh. sitting on the aisle so I can get up. <laughs> if anybody has a question they want to pass on. Uh, this is for Anthony Fontes. You know, uh, there have been people who said that it's American demand that drives the drug trade. I mean, if we didn't demand it, there wouldn't be the kind of money pouring into the gangs. And the cartels have got more money than law enforcement does. Correct. They got better weapons, they got you know armor piercing stuff, and they will kill anybody who gets in their way. So there has been a proposal, why don't you legalize all these drugs in the United States, have the government make them, nice and cheap, pure, synthetic. You can go to the drugstore to CVS, <laughs> buy a little bag of cocaine for 25 cents, and I, nobody I think, could I think impress this is for their the utopia girlfriend. Panel. This no, question is for yeah, the Utopia panel. Nobody could impress their girlfriend with, you know, I can blow 10,000 bucks on blow, and here's a couple of rolled $100 bills to shoot up your nose, and then we'll go have sex in the swimming pool, <laughs> if you could get it from the CVS. And if you take the money away, you take the corruption away. Now, I don't know whether it's practical or not, but is any, any part of that possible? Great, great question. Great and question. that was not the question I was going to ask. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Professor Fonte. Right, as I said, uh, you know, the solutions, the, one, the solutions that are available are, might be utopian, and then, but that, that's what we're here to discuss, right? Um, in, in terms of, uh, on, on oh, oh, in, in, in all that detail you gave, you're far too sort of correct on a lot of different fronts. Um, I, I would say that, yes, the, the amount of money being brought in by uh, drug trafficking organizations is uh, tantamount to the GDPs of these countries, right? Mm -hmm. um, given the extent of poverty, it's become one of the major um, uh, uh, money-making, uh, ways to make money, especially for the poor in the country. It's also deeply embedded in the moral economies of places, right? So I know that, um, especially along the border regions where narco-traffickers have operated for generations, right, since the 70s, and it's only grown, uh, they're seen as benefactors um, by large swaths of the population. Uh, so in a, in a sense, and there have been movements actually under, under former President Perez Molina, um, in the uh, early 2010s actually started making noise about legalizing the traffic of cocaine through Guatemala. Uh, and 
In retrospect, it was just to get the, 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 the uh, Clinton State Department to come down and give some more money, which it worked as well, right? They started, they started some dialogue between other countries. The U.S. came in, no, 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 don't do that. Um, here's some money to uh, help fight the drug problem. Um, I don't think that, you know, eliminating, if, if you could all of a sudden sort of magically wave a wand and eliminate the, uh, the, the money coming in for, for drug traffickers, it wouldn't resolve the prob deep problems of um, elite impunity in the country or the deep corruption in the country. It would cause a lot of chaos at first, right? Um, and the, the real problem, I think, the, 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 the drug trafficking organization, it's, it's legalization and ending U.S.-led war on crime, a war on drugs policies is a first step. Um, now, that would have to come from the United States, right? It couldn't just happen in these countries. So where's, what's the state of play in terms of legalization of um, cocaine in the U.S. or methamphetamine for that mean, or even uh, uh, opioids, um, which in, increasingly in Guatemala is one of the major cash crops being developed there. Uh, I think it's a non-starter, right, uh, in terms of actually getting any U.S. administration on either side of the aisle to really push for an end to the war on drugs policies. Um, so you know, outside of utopic imaginings, I, I don't think that's, that, that's really possible. The other thing is that, to me, the problem goes deeper than the drug traffickers, and it's, it's really about decades of, decades, centuries of, of a tiny elite holding on to power by whatever means possible, and making sure that no government entities can interfere with what they're doing. I'll give you an example. You know, Guatemala has the lowest tax rate in the hemisphere, right? 12% flat tax. Um, which everyone does their best not to pay. And this is because of, of an elite rule that has gone on and been buttressed and held up and given political cover by the United States, uh, especially during the Cold War, uh, that has made it, Im and, and that impunity for the elite, the, way, the ways that they've been able to protect their interests, gets into, for example, the banking system. So extortion is one of the major problems and run by gangs um, and, and uh, feeding off poor communities. Much of the extortions now happen literally with people making deposits in bank accounts, right? And when I talk to attorney generals and people who work, uh, you know, the, 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 the good guys in the, um, in the Ministerio Público and other in the AG's office in Guatemala, when they and talk about the problem of extortion, which is one of the major um, um, forces driving out migration because of violence in the region, they say the hardest thing in tracking down extortion isn't even finding witnesses or going after the gangs. It's getting the banks to give up their information because there's no financial oversight laws because of elite rule for generations making sure that no one could look into how they're dealing with their money. So um, not that I'm sidestepping your, your question. I would love if we could all do exactly what you just described. Um, <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day... Uh, to solve the I, problem, uh, he meant. <laughs> right. Um, uh, right. I think if it was something that's more doable, more viable, actually gets to, and get to the core of the issue would be increasing oversight of um, uh, transactions, elite, elite transactions that go far beyond uh, just drug trafficking. Very helpful. Thank you very much. We have two colleagues on this side. Please introduce yourself and ask our first question here. Yes, hi. My name is Valerie Lacarte from the Institute for Women's Policy Research here in D.C. Uh, my question isn't as interesting as the previous one, so um, How could it be? I have I wanted to know more information about vulnerable groups amongst the migrants. So I know Maureen touched upon that earlier, but for instance, we talked about the limited capacity of Mexico to deal with migrants. And even though we tend to focus on the U.S. and how harsh some of the uh, of the policies are right now. You know, uh, Mexico has its own history as well. Uh, when it comes to, I'm thinking about Afro-descendant populations from Honduras, from Guatemala, uh, indigenous populations that may not even speak Spanish and who are coming through Mexico. There was this famous case of um, uh, Amilcar Colon, Colon Quevedo, right, who was released in 2014 after staying five years in pretrial detention in Mexico, and he was a member of the, Garifuna, of the Garifuna community in Honduras. So I'm wondering, are there people that we're not even capturing right now? Uh, earlier I heard in a panel that Africans, so extra regional migrants, are even being stopped at the southern border of Mexico. Are there groups from the information that you have that are particularly being targeted by you know harsher um, Methods. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, I think anyone stuck in Tapachula feels pretty vulnerable just given the precarious situation that they're in and they think very easily targeted because even Central Americans for the most part are fairly identifiable by Mexicans, whether they're Garufuna or not. I mean, I think there's just a general targeting Central Americans and migrants in transit. I think, you know, beyond the LBGTI community, um, I think domestic violence victims, and we didn't talk about that as much, I mean, there's a lot of women that are fleeing Central America and girls because of interfamiliar violence and feel very much persecuted by their perpetrators sometimes in, into Mexico. Another is unaccompanied children. We have, you know, did these series of videos interviewing Central American children from Honduras. Um, one girl, I remember, she had been um, basically forced into to working with prostitution for one of the, the gangs, fled to Mexico, escaped a kidnapping attempt in Mexico, and then was offered asylum. But she was 15, and her mom was in the United States. And so these other you know, conditions where there are people that maybe could qualify for protection in Mexico, but that's not necessarily in their best interest, given like you're going to be under Mexican state custody until you're 18, which is not a very effective system either. So that type of vulnerable group, especially of, of children traveling on their own. Um, I would say there is a large African and extracontinental population that is pretty much stuck in Mexico right now, and I think that's what we've seen in terms of the, 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 um, the media lately. And it has to do with some changes to how Mexico has applied his, its uh, visa system lately, um, I think for extracontinentals and for Cubans, which was up until a few months ago, if you were from a country that didn't have a very good consular presence in Mexico or, there, or no consular presence or a country that didn't want to receive its population like the Cubans up until recently, then Mexico wasn't sure what to do with you if you're coming from Congo or other where. So they would give you an exit visa, oficial de salida. I mean, this is commonly termed as exit visa or the Cubans use it as a paso de salvaconducto, like a safe passage to get to the border. And it was good for 20 to 30 days and you could get anywhere in Mexico. Well, they decided, I think under pressure to change that visa, and particularly we saw it in August, where now you are issued perhaps an exit visa, but to go to southern Mexico. You have to leave through the southern border of Mexico, which basically means there's no real possibility for these people to farther go and farther north without being detected. And it's a population a lot of times that doesn't feel like Mexico is the right place for them to be re requesting protection, um, whether it's because they have no cultural language affinities to Mexico. I mean, there's a lot of like the African population that might fit there, or they, you know, the Cubans also most of them really want to, their main destination is the United States, and so I think there's a, basically, a lack of response right now from the Mexican government to what other options this population might have that doesn't want to request protection in Mexico, that really just wants to keep going, but really has no way to safely and humanely do that right now, and so I think it is a big challenge that we have not gotten a clear answer from the Mexican government of what else they could offer or what else they could do to support that population. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts about that um, as well, but I think there is certainly people that are particularly vulnerable. Um, and we also see the same thing with the, the MPP or the people being you know, stuck at them, the Mexican border that may return from the United States. We also have lots of vulnerable people that should not be in that program that are continually being you know, sent back to Mexican border towns that are also very vulnerable just given their, their, their conditions and how they're traveling. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps to add that, um, if, at least from our perspective, perhaps the most vulnerable groups of people currently, especially in Mexico, is a transsex and LGBTI community, um, both because uh, within the, the sort of the, the detention centers, but also outside, uh, the level of violence still remains quite, um, quite high. And it is specifically for them that we have pushed very hard to uh, set up a small resettlement program to make sure that they could uh, sort of find some protection without having to, you know, walk across borders and, and sort of put themselves further at risk. And I guess the sec for me, the SECO's largest, more, most vulnerable group is really the unaccompanied children who are in, in Mexico and for whom uh, there are uh, very few solutions, particularly those who have um, family members here and who are aiming to come to the United States because they have parents or, or, or extended family members here. So for, for those, we have now for a number of years advocated to set up some sort of alternative legal pathway uh, to the United States, specifically because we felt that those uh, th these, these children um, were in any case coming here. A very little will dissuade them from coming here, will make their way here, so we might as well do that in the most orderly, organized, and safe place, safe way possible for these children. So this discussion has been going on for quite some time now. Thank you, Kira. <clears throat> I have three questioners now. We'll start again on this side because I'm just watching as people come down and taking them in order. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Akshay Valia. Uh, since this panel talked about like the greater uh, issues that are leading to people migrating from Central America, uh, basically when last fall, when the Trump administration suspended aid to uh, S uh, Central American countries, uh, there was actually like a CBP report last September, which actually mentioned that uh, a lot, lot of the people who are migrating from rural Guatemala are being forced to migrate due to uh, climate change affecting agriculture there. Uh, one of the factors was like a fungus which affects like coffee plants and, and it's leading to uh, declining yields and people uh, not being able to support themselves. So uh, my question was more like we obviously talk about the effects of violence, how that's shaping people having to migrate from other regions, but like when climate change being uh, now uh, a major cause for through different means of like leading to pe people to migrate and on the other hand we see that basically there's an increasing uh, uh, restrictions on like what uh, con what conditions and reasons people can claim asylum for as we see in the US now uh, and also like restriction of like many people who apply for asylum claims being branded as economic migrants uh, how do we uh, move ahead and be able to solve these uh, basically intersecting challenges where it's not very clear to define as in who's a refugee and who's not and when uh, there could be multiple factors leading to people migrating. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> adding to the complexities. Um, so um, I believe that this problems have been there for a very, very long time in terms of the, the complexities of the flows. Uh, the, 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 the sort of the econo I'm not an expert in the economic situation of, of these countries, so I will not talk to that, but I do know that it does play a part in, in decision of people to move on and to try to find uh, solutions you know, to a better life and for their families, etc. cetera. Um, from our perspective, it's always been that um, there has to be a sustained investment in, 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 in the three countries of the Northern Triangle if we are to see um, you know, a, a meaningful chance of people actually establishing a, a life in these countries and, and staying there, because I don't think anybody wants to leave their homes if they can stay there, right? Um, and that, of course, has been jeopardized over recent times by, you know, by having a much more... Uh, sort of strict approach to the funding um, availability to, to this country. So that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge, and a real challenge that we very often bring to, bring to, um, to, the, to the table when we discuss with, with, with everybody involved is practically saying that UNHCR can only do so much. Uh, we, can only, we can only support you in doing so much if the problem is not addressed at the core and at the root. We are going to continue you know, sort of addressing the, 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 the impact rather than, uh, rather than the problem itself. So that is a fundamental issue. And unless there is a structured way of, of, of addressing the challenges in this country from, you know, a climate change perspective, from a, from a, you know, from a law and order perspective, from, from a broader institutional perspective, and some of the challenges that you were discussing, Anthony, I think we are not going to, in 10 years, we are still talking about the same issues mm -hmm. altogether, you know, and, and that will not take us very far. So that is certainly uh, at the root of, uh, as it is for all, uh, all situations, you know, when, when you have mass, mass, mass scale displacement, uh, there, are all, there are always a number of factors leading to that. Um, if you look at Venezuela, we have a very similar situation uh, where you know, it's a mixed flow. You have certainly people are fleeing for protection related reasons, but you also have people are fleeing because you know, there has been a collapse of, 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 of the state in many ways. So, um, yeah, looking at root causes and investment in, in these countries is certainly, you know, investing in everything from, you know, looking at how the country is being managed to how, you know, the type of, of corruption, the issue linked to, to cartels and drug trafficking, all of that has to be looked in a very serious manner. The rest of us can only sort of, you know, put band-aids on the problem. Right. I, I would just add, thank you, Kay, I would just add that, you know, as I said before, I think I, <coughs> asylum is the little door that holds up the big wall in the sense that it's always only let in a tiny trickle of people uh, defined by very strict um, uh, and often uh, very strict uh, categories that don't often line up with the reality of what makes people leave their country in the first place. And as well, it's only deal, it's like the worst case scenario, right? It's after everything has, has totally gone wrong that asylum becomes an, an option. There are, you know, you mentioned uh, in terms of uh, cutting off of U.S. aid to these countries as a, a sort of a, a, a big stick to make them do something. What? Who knows, really, right? Uh, but I think there's a number of small ways, even, even um, I won't call them small or subtle, but ways that I think are less advertised that the U.S. has been 
uh, so, uh, in, in the recent past supporting positive change in the region uh, that have uh, evaporated under this administration with, without a whole lot of attention. So what, what, what comes to my mind is the, uh, the now ended uh, program of, of CCIG, for those of you who aren't Guatemala watchers, the, um, uh, the Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, uh, that, which was a long-standing since 2007 UN supported body of literally going after those elites and elite power that I've been talking about before, brought to brought one president down, brought, uh, in, in, it exposed huge uh, corruption scandals among the Guatemalan elite that was making some very systematic and structural changes in, the, in how um, uh, the Guatemalan elite were able to do business and had broad popular support. Um, under Perez Molina, the last president, they, he threatened to take away its mandate. Uh, Vice President Biden and the State Department stepped in and said, if you do that, we're cutting off funding, and it stayed, right? Three years later, uh, President Jimmy Morales, who's like a little Trump, uh, right, uh, straight, you know, a, a comedian from t made for TV um, character, uh, who uh, d he, he was starting to get sniffed at by CC and tracking him down, uh, and, and when he threatened to get rid of them, along with a lot of uh, uh, congressmen, the U.S. did nothing, sort of looked the other way, right? That, just that, that, that single um, sort of looking away is going to cause untold um, uh, uh, sort of reversals in uh, the, the little bit of progress that's been made towards reining in elite impunity and some of these major structural issues. So it doesn't all have to involve massive um, programmatic uh, uh, investments, um, and it can really just continuing on with some of the programs that have succeeded um, at least gives the sense for people in the region that someone is, in, you know, that there is hope. And I think that preservation, even invention and, and, and resurrection of some sort of hope for people in the region is key to actually starting a stop, uh, stemming these flows uh, and making people invest in the places where they are in ways that are possible. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Anthony. So we have six minutes left and we have three questioners and they're all going to get to as, as, ask a question, but I'm good at math so I know how to do this. Please, if each of you would ask your questions now and succinctly and then I think we'll just have the panel take them in and respond um, as the final sort of round of comments, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Julia Toro. I'm an immigration lawyer trying to help these people who do get here uh, remain here and fight these cases that our immigration judges don't believe the corruption. They don't believe the police are corrupt. They don't believe that there are no protections for these people and they can't do internal replacement. Of course they could internally relocate. They don't get that the gangs, you know, uh, have infiltrated everything. And so um, in my entire practice and studies when I was in law school, it was always, we got to look at the long-term picture. And one of you had mentioned, you know, long-term, we have to see how can we fix this? Because it's not a border solution, it's not an overnight solution. And so uh, someone had mentioned, you know, there's got to be greater investment. And so more nations have to be invested. It can't just be the US uh, worried about this, more nations invested, but in practically speaking, you know, who's going to invest? How can we get people to invest? How can we change this cycle of, you know, trying to elect someone for an overnight fix or whoever's in charge now, you know, thinks that a wall and crocodiles are going to solve the problem. And it's not. We know that. So, you know, long-term fixes, who do we go to to say, you know, you got to do your, are we talking U.S. politicians? Are we talking uh, U.N. officials? Are we talking, you know, what is going to be resolved in this U.S. Uh, long-term fix so that you know it's not the US putting a puppet leader into a new country which has been the problem in the history that we know um, and so for the investments how, who's making these investments to improve these situations thank you hello I'm Daniel Costa with the Economic Policy Institute and I think my question is sort of a narrow one it's mostly directed at Maureen and Kiara um, uh, one of the uh, tools in the policy toolbox has been uh, issuing work permits to uh, asylum seekers in countries of uh, destination. And uh, I know AMLO's administration was giving them out for a while and they stopped, but it's been sort of hard to get good information about it. The reporting has been sort of sparse and um, uh, it's even hard to get information about it from people who are in Mexico. So I'm just wondering, uh, can you offer any additional context about how that's worked, what's happened? Um, you know, are ILO offices and UNHCR offices working together to push governments to do that and, and, and make it more common? Um, what's been the experience? Any, anything you can offer along those lines? Great question, Dan. Thanks. 
And our third question. Hi, I'm Connor. I'm interning at the Center for Democracy in Americas. And I just wanted to ask, um, the current administration has chosen to cut foreign assistance to Central America. And I wanted to know, what are the long-term effects that we're going to see from that, um, mostly in terms of poverty and displacement and violence? Thank you. Thank you. OK. So who would like to start? <laughs> sure, go ahead. OK, Thank you. <clears throat> let's talk about positive things. Um, so. A work permit. So we have seen that Mexico has made a point of uh, developing what we, what we call a local integration program, pretty much in the areas that Maureen was discussing in the Rosaltillo, in, in the sort of an industrial corridor of Mexico, where for the first time we're actually seeing that asylum seekers who have uh, and refugees are able now to get, uh, who are legally residing uh, in Mexico and are favorably considered for protection, are able to stay in Mexico with a work permit and are also integrated into the labor bar market through a job placement system that UNHCR and the government of Mexico are, are working together on, and it's been very successful so far in terms of the retention rate and, and uh, making sure that um, companies abide by a set of standards when it comes to employment standards. Uh, there are, of course, also examples like the one Maureen uh, explained er earlier that there, in certain circumstances, um, refugees are finding themselves in working in sectors that are not high paying, uh, but Overall, what we have seen is that uh, we have an 85% uh, retention rate of people who have been uh, sort of channeled into this employ employment scheme. And um, it has also been um, coupled with uh, uh, insertion for children whose parents have been uh, placed in these in this, in this, in this new employment schemes, also for children to have access to education, and so sort of making sure that we are stabilizing the family and we're making sure that you know the parents are able to work and the children are able to go to school. So that's been really positive. Um, and that's very much uh, coming out of uh, this regional framework that I was talking about earlier, where Mexico has committed to developing this, this integration program. And I must say that it, it, it has certainly been a very good example of, of, of a country that is trying to do something to actually stabilize population where they have sought protection. The other good example is Guatemala. Uh, the, the government has just announced uh, recently that as part of this regional framework, they would issue work permits for people who are uh, um, recognized as refugees in Guatemala. So that's also very positive. Now, uh, obviously, we have a different economic scenario in Guatemala than we have in Mexico. Um, but nonetheless, it is, it is a step in the right direction. So does it actually work for those who... Yeah, that's what I was trying permits? to say in a diplomatic manner. That, uh, <laughs> well, you're the diplomat. I was yeah. trying to say that clearly we have a different economic uh, realities. Um, but the fact that the government is willing to share uh, whatever they have, uh, it's, not a bad, it's not a negative thing. I mean, Thank you for clarifying. Clearly, the international community has a lot to do in this. Um, yes. Maureen, did you want to? Sure. Um, I think there's a few things with these work permits. I mean, there's, there's one, when you're applying for asylum, you can apply for humanitarian visa to allow you to work. But humanitarian visas are also like their own category as, as a visa that this government used a very liberal interpretation the first few months of the year of like for public, I think it was like um, the orden publico, like it was public like use, interest to provide this many people with humanitarian visas. About over 20,000 people in the first few, two months of this year got humanitarian visas because there was the caravans coming through. And I think the government, Mexican government, wasn't feel, feeling that they could adequately address that population in a short period of time. So let's give them visas. They can work here. They have to be renewed every six months to a year. Humanitarian visas, traditional categories, actually, for victims of violent crimes in Mexico so they can stay in the country and pursue their criminal complaints against aggressors. So, so more like a, a U visa here. I mean, that was one of the main purposes, actually. They have used it in other categories. A lot of Haitians got humanitarian visas in Tijuana when they were stuck after the Obama administration stopped issuing humanitarian paroles for Haitians. So it's like a different, it's a weird category. You can find on, I can send the, the INM, their webpage actually has per month how many humanitarian visas are being issued. So if you look for data, I can certainly um, give that to you. I think there's been over 28,000 for this year uh, alone. I think there is though a clear thing of disconnect between labor shortages in Mexico and maybe need. Um, I was speaking to someone from Coparmex, which is one of Mexico's biggest medium to small size business corporations or associations who also understand they need to do better to match where they might actually have labor shortages to 
to needs. Um, the Mexican government so far has more minimal programs in southern Mexico, this Sembrando Vida, which is a very small program meant to start providing economic or employment opportunities for, for Central American migrants. We have not seen that out at all in like a mass scale yet. Mm -hmm. And I think just to comment on you know what can be done here and, and what's happening with the United States and assistance, I think the US Congress has been probably the best backstop to the administration's worst intentions in terms of slashing all aid to Central America. I mean, this assistance does and had been working to look at climate change adaptability, to rule of law programs, to you know, evidence-based violence prevention programs, to good governance. We think there's an aid to, to do aid. Congress has worked to make sure next year you can't stop. You can't, they're working to try to not allow that to happen again, so aid to not be cut. And I think that's just one area where the US Congress continues to really push on the need to support Central America, on the need to support anti-corruption efforts in Central America. And I think it's also continuing to push members of Congress, particularly in this context, to, to keep doing that to really look at root causes of migration from Central America. Um, Last word, Anthony. And right. I know we're beyond our time. So I'll just take on the long, the long-term fix issue, and and get all professorial for a second. My apologies, but you know the the problem that what's happening in Central America is at least 50 years in the making, right? And 50 years of, of sustained U.S. policy supporting uh, the powers that have kept the status quo more or less what it is, from toppling you know second elected president in Guatemala to supporting. Um, uh, scorched earth campaigns and genocide in Guatemala and El Salvador um, uh, 30 years later, right? So this has been sustained, it's taken a sustained effort to keep things, make things this bad. And it's gonna take that a sustained effort to um, over an equal amount of time, uh, as Kiara was saying, not 10 years, but I think, you know, a good, another generation uh, to, to actually do anything to resolve what's happening now. And again, echoing things that have been brought up in, in, in prior panels, these problems have been going on for a long time. The crisis at the U.S. border is just, to, in many ways, an emanation, an expression, um, a, a, a spectacularization of problems that, of a crisis that's been uh, ongoing in Central America for generations, right? And that the U.S. has helped sustain in all sorts of ways. Uh, and it's, I believe, a moral responsibility and also a pragmatic need uh, that what, you know, what goes around comes around. The, the, this, the, the crucible of Central America exploded in the 80s because of conditions that um, were, you know, uh, that, that were um, unlivable. And I think those conditions are being repeated again in a way that is much harder to pick apart and understand. But unless something is done in a, in a, in a on a long-term sustained basis, then um, this, continued, this is gonna continue to cause major uh, uh, disruption and, um, and suffering in Central America, and that's gonna echo out for uh, generations across the region. Thank you very much. Uh, please join me in thanking these experts. <laughs>